Greetings everyone, this is Timothy Unks. So today I'm gonna to be lecturing to you guys about what is the utilization of technology amongst patients and what's all the novel stuff that's out there that's being utilized to help with patient care. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff out there, personally. Um, and with that being the case, I really wanna like talk about some of the stuff that's really popping up that's really changing the dynamic of patient care overall. So to start with, you know, here's the objectives. You guys got that on your slides. So I'm not gonna go into detail. You know, think about this. How many of you guys have ever Googled a health concern? How many of you have had a family member look something up or has asked you something and you've had to look into this information and say, you know, you know, um, it's even something in class, you're like, I hear about this information, like, what's the wrong side of pain? What's this other stuff? And you go to Wikipedia, you go to Mayo Clinic, you go to something like that. And you're not the only ones. Patients do this all the time. They're encumbered by so many different things out there. And I think there's a changing dynamic in terms of how do you get health information. Coupled with that is the fact that you know, many people see providers that get information about them and they document it. And now patients want the access to data. You know, they walk out of a meeting with their, their physician and they're like, you know, what is my A1C today? What is my cholesterol level? What do they write about me? And is this actually a push for this whole open notes movement where patients can actually read um, soap notes and documents about the patients? And this has actually been very interesting. We've seen some actually complications from this, um, especially old notes where someone may have put something else down that you really didn't expect a patient to see. I've heard conversations where some patients want diagnoses actually removed because they don't agree with the diagnoses. So this is this is opening up a whole can of worms that we never had in the past. I think it's I think it's very interesting because of that and like in terms of how we're gonna deal with the whole nature of healthcare overall. Now one person I want you to watch and the, uh, the video is linked um, is David De, uh, DeBronco. Um, he actually lives in Massachusetts. He lives, I think, between here and Boston. Um, I think he was either going to UMass or, or a cancer center in, in Boston for treatment. And he was told he was going to die. Okay. And he was recommended by his oncologist to go to a social group to really talk to other people. And this is a great TED Talk. So I want you to watch this. Okay. And we'll come back and have a little discussion about this. And we'll go from there. So, you know, take a break. Okay, you're back. Good job. So you watch the video. It's really I I love I I've act, I love his uh, presentation. It's older. I've actually met him a few times uh, at different conferences, and he's a great speaker. He does rap in person uh, to mix results. Let's just be honest. But I mean, his story is so good. I mean, I love the fact that you know he found this online group that really helped him think about other therapy that he wasn't even being offered, you know, the interferon, and he's alive. I mean, he was told he was going to die, and he's alive still. And he is a big push for what I call the e-patient movement, which is really trying to get patients to engage with all the resources they have out there. And this e-patient movement, I think, is quite defining for the era that we live in, in terms of how people will engage on online tools and such, and how they will look for different resources. So, you know, what is an e-patient? To me, they're basically... Uh, this is the late Tom Ferguson's uh, definition, but there's the, they're, they're the individuals who will seek online guidance for their own ailments or on behalf of someone else. And they're equipped, enabled, empowered, and engaged. You have all these different tools. You think about, you have a smartphone, you have the internet, almost all of man's knowledge is on there, and you have access to it. And we've seen this for good and bad. I mean, just watch with COVID right now, the whole vaccines and even early on disease information. Where were people getting their information? Was it the news or were they just going online and getting whatever they could? I mean, that's the reality of the situation. We saw a whole debate about, you know, hydroxychloroquine and everything else like that. Um, you know, were steroids good? Was this bad? Was it, Should you take NSAIDs if you have a fever? So like, it was all over the place. And that's it. I and mean, we live in a real-time world where information is just on the go. You think about it, you get everything else. You can date online, you can order food online, you can shop online. Why can't you get your health online? And at the end of the day, when we think about just the practice of healthcare, Think about how many times patients see, you know, their provider. It's very limited. They see them maybe, you know, a handful of times throughout the year. Think about the last time you saw your doctor. And the reality is most of them manage your own health care. So we looked at this as, as an iceberg. The, what you would then visualize is that there's a small subset of time that you see and deal with healthcare community. But most of the time you're on your own. You're following and dealing with your own health. And that's just the nature of how things run. So there's a huge push by companies and others to empower patients you know, because you're going to make some money off of this because healthcare is a great business opportunity in the United States and we'll go down that path. But to help push better self-care, doing uh, that and empowering patients. So these types of patients are very curious. They're tech savvy. Uh, they're a patient caregiver. 
they're engaged and they have social media to find other patients like that. I mean, it used to be years ago that we would say to a person like, oh, you have this condition and here's a pamphlet of information and you have no one else to talk to. Okay, like, you know, what do you do about this? There's a few groups in Worcester that I actually help out with and we'll go help like ostomy support groups and such diabetes support groups and talk and bring people together. But nowadays, everything's like almost moved online. You have discussion, you call someone, you can meet someone, you have online forums and share your experiences. And I think that's the beauty of it. So let's talk about the impact of technology and what this is doing for patient care. I think this has helped move it away from a paternalistic model where you know, you have to go talk to uh, someone that's trained to get information and they tell you what to do and then you do it. No, it turns into patients now have to engage with their healthcare practitioners. I mean, yes, there's the best evidence available, you know, guidelines, RCTs, blah, blah, blah. There's individual expertise, but then the patient values and preferences come into play. And this is evidence-based medicine in terms of how then do you make the decision to, you know, what give the decisions or give uh, options for a patient to engage upon their health. And I think this comes back to it. It's like this whole on-demand mentality. I mean, if you can deliver groceries, why not deliver your health care as well? You, I, I'm, I'm, I've seen push for right now with the COVID vaccination. Why do I have to go somewhere and stand in line to get vaccination? Why can't someone just come to me and give it? I mean, that's that's kind of where things are. People are asking these questions. I think they're valid. Because um, at the end of the day, you have so much information that you can get on the go. And yeah, you can dump on WebMD, but there's actually, this stuff is blown up. If you look at the National Health Services in England and the UK, um, they actually have an AI-empowered chatbot that you can actually talk to to figure out, you know, oh, you have chest pain, and it'll go through different things and go through, you know, a triage format of saying, oh, you know, maybe you're having a panic attack. Maybe you're actually not having, like, true um, cardiac issues. Or maybe you do, because you have a history of this. You, we, can we, we can send you an ambulance right now and get you to an urgent care center. And that's just, the value for this is scalability. There's not enough health care, health care practitioners in the United States. We turn to technology to help us basically scale better care at the end of the day. And that to me is where, you know, we can joke about this stuff, but that's where people are going to go. They're going to Google their information first before they actually want to talk to someone. Or in your case, you might have family members that will reach out to you because you're easy, easily accessed and say, you know, I feel like that's what I wish I do. Genomic information? Yeah, it used to be thousands of dollars and now it's cheap. You actually get drug information this way nowadays, and patients can see if they're hypermetabolizers or poor metabolizers of their own drugs. Um, yeah, like, that's very interesting. They might show up in your pharmacy and say, hey, you know, this thing told me this, and I'm on this drug. Should I change it? Hmm, that's a good question. And, you know, there's a lot of buzz about, you know, different terminologies. Like, in the 90s, it's called eHealth, then early 2000s, it's called mHealth, and then now it's digital health. And there's all these different tools out there that's coming to market. And the reality is because you have widespread wireless internet connection, that you have access to resources to social groups, you have digital health devices and wearable sensors and online patient portals and genomic testing on the go. Like, you can buy almost everything you want. Um, there's so many apps out there, so many different forums, different trackers. I could go into detail about this, but you could just Google and, you know, like, what sensors are there, are there for your health? And you'll find a lot. You know, we look, think about, like, do you have a health tracker? I think the biggest uh, defining stuff for this was actually when we went and had the smart uh, watches. So, you know, Apple Watch came to market, and what can this thing do? Like, you know, I, I pull it out, and I look at it, and like, you know, it had this thing, and now, you know, it tells me time, it has app support, I get alerts, but I can also track, you know, my heart rate, and actually tell me if I have, you know, atrial fibrillation. That's pretty amazing at this current time. That's really, you know, where things are going. Patients like this and hate it. Because now they actually get their health thrown at them in their face. Uh, there's actually been a bunch of false positives where people get their device and say, oh, you have atrial fibrillation, you go see your doctor, and they get EKG and say, oh, you don't have it. But it's actually catching people who do have uh, AFib that wouldn't have known. So, you know, it's a dual-edged sword. My, my argument is the science gets better and the technology gets better. This is just, you know, we had to get through sensitivity and specificity to, you know, hash out the intrinsics. But as time goes on, this stuff will get better and more, you know, in people's lives and more in their face. I think that's really telling. We have a bunch of Bluetooth enabled uh, de uh, measurement devices out there. You can take blood pressure now with a smart uh, Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuff. And you can actually uh, check your blood glucose too through the different meters out there. There's sleep trackers you can put in your bed. Wearables actually do this on your wrist too. You know, are you getting good night's sleep? I mean, think about that from a pharmacy's perspective. How many people suffer from insomnia and just get assigned a drug and, you know, they go on it and it's like, oh, now you got Ambien. 
did it work then how much were you sleeping before what's your actually bed hygiene what if we actually knew like okay you actually you know you were in here last month saying you couldn't sleep and i told you to stop playing your smartphone i can still see data saying you're still playing your smartphone i'm not going to give you a drug first until you do the educational perspective because i don't want to just throw this at you that might sound a little bit paternalistic but it gives options from a patient that actually quantify you know what is health and such or are you saying here's a drug are you sleeping better i don't know i think i am i think i'm not you know well let's look at the data Ah, well, yeah, you aren't sleeping better. You're still tossing and turning. You're not going to REM sleep. Okay, so let's try a different therapy. This is how you can use this information to tell patients. The patients get feedback on their own health. Um, there's other devices out there that you know are getting really much better. These are FDA cleared EKG devices to go back in your smartphone. You put your fingers on it, and it can tell you, you know, AFib, tachycardia, things like that. Um, continuous glucose monitoring. You're going to see this probably replace those freestyle light devices we told you to get for PCS lab. Um, eventually people with diabetes will just put a sensor on them. It may be an eye, maybe an earring. Right now the patches could go on the body or on the arms. Um, and, uh, you know, Freestyle Libre is, is, is one of the big ones that um, you see for two weeks that you can wear and just gives you glucose measurements and no more pricking your fingers. Patients love it. It's so much more data. You can do something so much more with it. And I think that's an amazing component. I think it really transforms, like, how do we, uh, you know, address or um, really uh, just, you know, go over healthcare for patients like this. And from my personal perspective, we're not ready for this. This technology is coming out way faster than we even know how to integrate. When you get into diabetes management, you'll see that there's not a lot of conversations about this stuff. But, you know, how does this impact diabetes or insulin dosing, for instance? How should everyone get this? Who shouldn't get it? Who should pay for it? These are questions that are still being asked. But, you know, when I, when I meet patients who have used this stuff, they don't want to go back. They don't want to go back to pricking their fingers, you know, three or four times a day. It sucks. They would rather slap this thing on. And just know when they're, you know, have hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. And they know when they give themselves medications, they can see their sugar going down. Or when they eat and the sugar goes high. And they're like, you know, I get immediate feedback in terms of how I'm doing. People are actually using this stuff for fitness too. If you actually watch sports, look out for uh, athletes who have this black patch on their arm. It's actually one of these Libres. And it's from a company called Levels and there's a few others. And they're actually using this for performance enhancement. Uh, basically to see, you know their trainers are using this data to help guide them and be like, oh, you know what, you need more of this or that, you're actually trashing down here and your performance dies. Like, there's so many ways we can do this. And I think, you know, the fact of the matter is patients can just get this on their own. They don't even have to get a provider technically to get some of this 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 stuff themselves. They go on the website and find it. I mean, they're taking it on their own. It's, it's amazing from that perspective. Now, we've also, what I think for us as pharmacists is very interesting is we have what I call smart del drug delivery systems. We actually have um, inhalers coming to market with a sensor built into it that you can actually see how many actuations they're doing and how well they're doing actuation. So you have a person like asthma that uses an inhaler more frequently, their SABA for instance, more frequent than they're requiring. You'd be like, hey, I see you're using this. Is everything okay? And they're like, eh, I don't know. I've just been using it more. Well, is it a sign that, you know, maybe it's an environmental factor that's leading to them use their inhaler more because of seasons? Is it actually they're having a disease exacerbation? Should they be reached out before they go into ER because it doesn't work anymore? Or maybe their therapy is just not working and they need better long-term treatment. I mean, this opens the door instead of a patient waiting to show up in the clinic or in the hospital when they're actually not doing that great. Other ones out there is these are smart bioadjustable sensors that can actually go into a medication. So you actually have a um, pills they have a little sensor in it, and actually when you swallow it, you can actually see that they actually swallowed this medication. So right now it's uh, approved for uh, major depressive disorder, um, for uh, schizophrenia, um, for uh, bipolar disorder. And how it works is basically you can use this and say, hey, um, is this patient actually taking their medication on time and, and appropriate? Or, you know, if they have schizophrenia and they're skipping their medications, and do we need to reach out and check on why? before they have a problem. I think these are, this opens up a really interesting Pandora's box in terms of how we treat patients and address their needs. We have smart insulin pens. We have smart drug delivery devices, uh, injectables going to market that tell you when to inject and how much to inject. This is, this is quite cool too. Um, we also have apps that are coming out with this stuff that they're called digital therapeutics, but basically patients can actually get care through an app. It can deliver cognitive behavioral therapy. They've asked to actually tell them how much insulin to inject and such. They don't have to talk to a healthcare professional. Everything's being delivered through this thing. That's amazing. We've never been down this road in the past. And I think it opens up really great possibilities for patients to take more self-ownership of care. 
They just need to know how to use it. I think that's where we're going to see ourselves as pharmacists come into play at some point in terms of helping them navigate this stuff. Because otherwise, they're going to go on online forums and such. And they may not get the best information. And this has actually come up. Um, you can, and I, and I challenge you, go on YouTube and look at people that, you know, tell themselves how to inject therapy, like interferon or just like other, like Humera, stuff like that. If you watch our videos, we've actually done research and find that almost 50% actually are giving wrong information. They're training themselves based on what they remember. And they're actually giving information out to other patients like, oh yeah, just heat it up like this or warm it up or, you know, inject it at this angle. And they're wrong. They're not actually supposed to do that. And now people are copying them because they rather look up a YouTube video than actually, you know, talk to their professional because they don't want to schedule the time for it. But that's, and, that, and that's what I'm trying to drive down to you is patients are going to do what they feel most comfortable with, what's easy of access. How do we help engage or help coach them or help them find the right resources? That I think is key right now. So I'm going to talk about this inhalers that's smart. This is, these are from uh, Teva. They have like three smart inhalers that are now in the market that are being released. Um, and it's all integrated with a smartphone. I mean, the reality is over 90% of the population has a smartphone at this current time. Um, if you look at Apple Health Kit, almost everything syncs in there and can track all your health and such, your fitness and integrate with the EHR with like Epic and you can download all the information there. Patients ask, you know, how's my cholesterol been? Well, pull up your smartphone. If you have the data in there, there you go. Now I can see it. I think you can take advantage of that. It's also pharmacists. People ask questions. Like, you know, do you have this connected? If you don't, maybe you should. Maybe we can look at it together. Let's talk about social media. So I'm going to show you an example. Um, you know, coming up here, like, you know, I don't have TikTok on here. And that's something else that you could probably add. Uh, but, you know, there's so many communities that exist, whether it's on Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr and Google Plus, yeah, let's, let me get rid of that. But Reddit communities are actually pretty good, too. I actually recommend if you're looking for, like, you know, a patient's experiences, look at some of the stuff. Look at these online communities. You'll find that they're huge hubs for patients to actually go in here and share their experiences. And actually for self-care, you know, what to do. Um, some of it is actually really telling in terms of if these are true trends, they're actually pretty dangerous and things that we should probably do from a public health perspective to help cut back or address their needs. I, 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 I actually, that's how I look at it. It's like, you know, where patients do that, I can give recommendations or get the communities to go join and talk to, especially if they feel lonely about their own health or, you know, keep an eye out for like, what are trends that we need to be concerned about? Um, so you're looking for that angle. Now I'm going to show you uh, one that uh, came up here about uh, this past week. So this guy um, on TikTok, he was actually, he's an elite athlete. He has uh, videos out there. He has Parkinson's. And he, uh, I'm going to show this video. I think it's really interesting just because it shows his difficulty. And the, the background is, if you look at the medications for Parkinson's, it's something they're really, really tiny. And if you think about um, all the, you know, tardive dyskinesias and everything associated with movement, like, you know, if you see some people, like, look at Michael J. Fox in public and you'll actually see he has hand tremors. Try to give a small pill that's, you know, that's, that when you're having, you know, active disease. It's, it's very difficult. Um, and he was sharing his frustration. So, like, let's see. Play this. Maybe I need to refresh it one second. Do, 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 do. I want to play one more time. So we're gonna pause. So yeah, look at him. He, he's having trouble picking up these medications, and he puts out there, you know, like, you know, he's he's you know he's, he think he's venting and such. But people picked up on this. Um, he got a lot of views. I mean, like you know, sixty-five thousand likes on this, for instance, right now. Um, and what ended up happening was this guy actually saw his video and he was like, you know what, maybe we can 3D print you a better pill bottle. Okay, like I, I would not have thought of that right off the bat. But he's like, yeah, let's, let's make a bottle. Let's make a container that can fit on it with a better lid so that you can actually pour out the medications easier. And people like this thing. People are actually been copying. They're actually trying to print it for family members or to buy them. That's what they want. There's communities. They will see this stuff and like they think, I struggle with that. I have these issues. My doctor never told me about that. So, you know, let's go there. I, I love this one post that was recently on Twitter, for instance. This um, patient was like, did you know you could take certain pill bottles and screw them upside down to make it easier to access? Yeah, if you work at Walmart or Tar uh, I think Walmart, Walgreens, their pill bottles like that. I don't think CVS is like that. Uh, but... Yeah, you can flip them upside down, make it easier to open. 
a lot of people don't know that and they're impressed they're like oh my god why didn't anyone ever tell me this stuff and they just pick up online they see it and they just they're like this is amazing and sometimes it's small things and you know it's it's quite interesting just online communities that pop up from all this stuff and i think it's amazing like you just talk in parkinson's uh pill bottle 3d print like look, look at this guy you know he, he's literally printing out a pill bottle at home that can help out with this stuff it's i'm impressed i am and i think this is really you know what we're seeing with time in terms of like how social media has turned to a outlet for many patients to engage in health because they're frustrated with how things are so don't ever be surprised in terms of what people may come up with it may be good or bad and i think that's really what we need to talk about here is um you know there's limitations some communities are really interesting this is patients like me i think i got acquired by pfizer or gsk uh, in the past two years for several million dollars uh, because people were sharing health information you know who wants to mind this Researchers and pharma really like this data because it helps them get a better assessment of disease and such. And there's some benefit there. You could say, you know, I'm a patient now. I'm involved with research. You know, people are listening to my problems and they're going to use this to help get my care better. So let's go from that perspective. Patients like me was actually founded by um, this guy whose brother has ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and the brother died. But he was trying to find other people with similar conditions. It's you know, what worked for you? What helps you live better and such? And this is turning to a lot of small, rare diseases platforms and even large. Um, uh, I would say other more common ones because people love talking to each other and sharing experiences to find out what can work better. Um, you see this with many things like my, my wife, for instance, uh, we just had, uh, we have a seven month old at home and she's involved with a lot of like mommy forums and mommy groups. She was actually an ambassador for one of these apps because she's been on it for so long. And it gives a lot of information and like people just talk about stuff, you know, related to her health. And I think it's just power through community. And I will never downplay that. So patients like me is, you know, one out there, you know, if you want to go look on it and navigate and take a peek at it, uh, what's interesting is Walgreens actually is integrated with them that you can actually uh, uh, see how people respond to different therapy or drugs over time. And they actually share their experience. Like, you know, how many people that have metformin have had diarrhea, for instance, or how they upset stomach? How long did it last? Like those questions people want to know, not just from like a small little pamphlet of information. Uh, other groups, Walking Gallery, if you want to pause here, Google it. These guys are interesting. Um, it's like community through art and it's a very interesting patient movement where people are trying to get more awareness in terms of the problems many people are facing I, i'll let you look into it, it, it just google it real quick you, and it's an interesting community out there uh the journal participatory medicine this is actually a journal run by patients patients actually talk about their diseases and their, their issues and their concerns i love this journal because you get a better viewpoint than just reading like an rct and be like oh we did this blah, blah, blah. but what about the patient perspective what about how they think about their health. I think this is a really good reference just to get some more ground rooted information that we don't often talk about, especially in drug lip, for instance. So let's talk about some of the shortcomings then. You know, I talked about a lot of the positives and a lot of stuff out there. Um, no, let's talk about vaccinations. There's going to be a lot of negative stuff about vaccinations. Let's be honest. It's going to be terrible. Um, you know, I love like this comic. This this comic is probably about you know eight years old, I think, at this point. You know, study linking autism, childhood vaccinations have not only been debunked, but it's an elaborate fraud that we trust ends the matter. No, I, I found like one study that's good. Uh, if you want to Google a humorous thing, it's a little lewd. So if you don't like that kind of humor, um, you could look like uh, if Google was a guy uh, is from College Humor, and they have like a whole stuff with people look up and like you know this crap that's out there. I, I like some of that humor, but you know it's out there um, and. It's it's we've we've had difficulties with it. And we're having more difficulty with this. We see actually healthcare professionals that don't even want to get vaccinated right now, um, and they say this online. So if you see like your doctor says I don't want to get the vaccine, do you think their patients want to get it? Especially when we had to deal with like influencer culture and such like that. People are like this or saying oh just do this therapy. Again, I come back to like the the DMOR debacle um, with hydroxy. And that's just how many people were trying to get on that bandwagon and it was failing. We've seen this issue for years when this whole spread and sentiment, and especially social media took off, we just saw diseases coming back. And the frustrations I have with this stuff is just that you have a platform where there is no centralized voice or perspective that really can be utilized well. And you can cause more harm than good at times. Um, and there's a lot of different stuff that comes out real quick. You can see information spread like wildfire, new fads, new things, new data. Oh, but did you read this study? No. And that's the one thing I love is that you'll see people say, a study just came out saying this. 
and they share the abstract of the PubMed leap, but they can't actually read the paper because they don't have access to it because they don't have access through the library. Uh, so they're just sharing the abstract, which don't go to like the limitations or even the designs of the study. So you can't really pick it apart and they just stand on it. That's a huge limit. And I think that's a disservice. I really do believe that more of this stuff should be open for patients at the end of the day. So, you know, are we ready for these types of patients? I don't think we have a choice. You don't have a choice. You're gonna live in a world where this is gonna be the norm. Uh, we have to be prepared for patients that will look up information, get it for themselves and engage upon it for good or for ill. I think that puts a lot of pressure on us to, you know, how do we navigate it? Um, we really need to change, like when we talk about patient centricity, think about if you go to any medical conferences, they talk about, oh, what do patients think? They share, you know, third hand stories about their dealings with patients, but they never actually invite a patient up there to talk about their disease. I find that quite fascinating. So where does pharmacy fall? Uh, question that we come up is people are like, oh, you know, robots and automation can replace pharmacists. Eh, it could replace a lot of it, but I think there's an opportunity for us to, you know, flip the model in terms of like, how do we engage with it? I see a lot of example for us to engage with technology, like, you know, what devices should you use? How do you use it? How do you set it up? Uh, especially when we see it get integrated. Maybe it's tech support, so, uh, support with that, possibly. Uh, you may or may hate that. You know, a patient comes in and says, oh, I got this new drug in it. I need an app to sync it up. Can you help me with it? Now you're going to be like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's, I think that's actually some things we're going to go, but people, maybe you can give them help coaching, not just, you know, lifestyle management, but also get them, you know, things that they can do to help monitor and guide their health. And I think we're at that point and you're going to see more um, education stuff coming out about that because that's one thing I'm a big pusher for uh, is that kind of role for us in the community to play because I think um, patients are going to come to you with information. People are going to use technology and hear stuff. And they may or may not choose to turn to a reputable source. And I think pharmacists, because we give our information away for free, can serve as a source, but it's going to be something that we have to be prepared for and understand better. So coming back into it, and then one thing is, and we talk about, you know, downturning paternalism, but also downturning, you know, current practice. The most dangerous thing that I think it can happen to us is we've always done it this way without taking the fact that technology has really been a force multiplier to change how practice is occurring. So, you know, this is my presentation on, you know, this, the overall environment that we're in. I want you to keep that in mind. This is where things are going. This is how things are acting right now. This is basically the world that we're entering. Um, and I think we'll get better at it, but it's just something right now for this. I want to generate that conversation amongst yourselves. So just keep this in mind. I mean, it's uh, definitely going to be an interesting time. I think it's definitely... Uh, issues that will creep up more. Take into account like all the stuff you're learning in this selective, just because I think if you throw into account like you know, all the reading, just think about the technological edge. How does that change practice? How does it change how people might do things? So anyway, this is Timothy Onks. Thanks for listening, and I hope you guys have a good day and be safe. Okay, bye bye.